today we'll be talking about chemical vapor deposition. CVD is a deposition method used typically under a vacuum to produce high performance and quality solid materials. ICVD is different since it uses an initiator to start the polymerization process. Once introduced into the process, the initiator thermally decomposes to form radicals, which are absorbed onto the surface and thus initiates a free radical polymerization. The low energy cost of ICVD holds advantages over other CVD methods, as the process can be conducted at low temperatures. CVD is an important technique that has wide-reaching uses in many industries. Many everyday objects use CVD coatings. Items from computer chips to food packaging use polymer coatings from CVD processes to improve their performance. The objective of our experiment is to learn and use an ICVD technique to see what variables affect the deposition of thin polymeric films. We'll be using hexyl acrylate as our monomer and terbutyl peroxide or TBPO as our initiator. The CVD technique is a method used to create thin films on substrates. It starts by creating a vacuum in the chamber before flowing the material into it. In this case, materials flowing in are hexyl acrylate and TBPO. The chamber filaments are heated up and the wafer in the side gets heated up as well. A chemical reaction occurs near the hot surface of the wafer which produces a thin film on that wafer. A laser is used to record the chemical deposition and it is seen on the computer's program as sinusoidal waves. The chemical byproduct and unreacted material get vented out of the chamber before the chamber is opened up for cleaning before the next sample runs. That was just a brief overview of the experiment and now we are going to continue with the actual procedure. So this is the setup for the experiment. Before starting, we verified that the vent lines of the chamber and vacuum pump were connected and attached to the fume hood. We also had to make sure that the chiller was on. For our case, we used 15 degrees Celsius. This is what the CVD program looks like after we close the throttle valve. Position is now set to zero degrees. In order to open the chamber, we purge the system by closing the valve located outside the closure and opening the nitrogen valve. Once it is open, we clean the chamber with acetone and add in our substrate. We adjust the substrate so that the laser hits it and refracts it into the camera above. Next, we asked the TA to add in the filament bank and it looks something like this. Next, we set a voltmeter to 200 ohms and we hold the probes against the leads to check for any current. Then we hold one of the probes against the side of the chamber to verify that there isn't any current. We then open up valve 2 fully and wait for the pressure to drop below 1000 millitor and then open valve 1 through the computer. Afterwards, we open up the nitrogen gas valve as little as possible while trying to achieve a stable chamber pressure of 0 0.150 torr. Next, we connect the orange filament leads outside the chamber and adjust the filament temperature to the desired point from the rheostat. In our case, we started with 10 degrees Celsius. After verifying that all of our material stages and filaments are heated to the set points, we manually open the upstream and downstream valves. As one of our teammates gets ready to close the nitrogen valve, we start data blogging and begin the desired flow by pressing auto on the program. Once we start seeing sinus of the curve, that is when the run begins. We know it's complete after 3-5 to five waves, and to count the waves, we start from the first low point in the wave. When the run is complete, we stop data blogging, turn off the heater, stop the flows, close the valves, and turn off the chiller. To calculate the results, we have the following equations. The first one calculates the angle of refraction from the laser and is equated to the square root of 1 minus the sine theta 1 squared over nu. Theta 1 is the angle of the laser and nu is a refractive index. 
to calculate the deposition amount, we have the following equation. The film thickness equated to the wavelength of the laser over 2 nu cosine theta 2. To calculate the rate, we have rate equals to the film thickness over, sorry, times the number of cycles within the sinusoidal waves over time. And lastly, for the activation energy, we have the natural log of the rate equated to 2 delta H over RT and the activation energy equated to negative 2 delta H. The following graph shows the TBPO flow versus the reaction rate at 10 sccm and 15 sccm. This is graph with the confidence interval as error bars. When a t-test was performed on the mean initiated flow rates, we get a value of 0 0.0496, which is below the 95% confidence value of 0 0.05, which proves that the data is statistically significant. The following two graphs show the data provided by Hoxers and Kelting. The first one here shows the inverse filament temperature versus the natural log of rate. You can see that the R-squared value is 0.5662, which means there's no correlation between the temperature and the rate. However, when the inverse substrate temperature versus the natural log rate was graphed, the R-squared value is 0.9589 which means as the temperature decreases, the rate increases, which proves that this is an exothermic reaction. Given that the data set for the first graph is statistically significant, we can conclude that increasing the TBPO flow rate does increase the reaction rate. However, further testing needs to be conducted to ascertain the level at which this affects the reaction rate. For the temperature data provided by Hoxers and Kelting, the rate shows a strong correlation to the stage temperature. This is the opposite to the filament temperature and, in and instead suggests no correlation. However, the data cannot be tested for statistical significance due to lacking the sample size for the data set. Therefore, we can only speculate and it would require further testing to see if the data sets had statistical significance. Thanks for watching.